issue of subset localization prediction. And in fact, I made a mistake. I believe we are still. Uh, we spoke about sequence similarity. We talked about the text, text similarity searches, but we did not enter the motifs, did we? The discussion of nuclear localization signals, did we begin that on Tuesday? Oh, oh, I remember now something else. Uh, the questions. We still have to set aside questions. Please remember that at the end of today's, and the end today will come a little bit earlier because I have to dash somewhere else. Uh, remember questions that we can sample for the exam. So text similarity is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is localization motifs. The background behind motifs, there are two types of motifs. One you may call it sequential and one you may call conformational. Sequential, what it means, you have a stretch of consecutive residues. In that stretch, you recognize the signal. There's some motif. Okay? This is like a regular expression in grep. There's a conformational motif that is of the type that this is very short, this is very short, but when it comes together on 3D, as a, as a protein structure, as you know, they're active only on that level here, then they actually forms a motif. So you could imagine that this is a patch of positive charges or negatively charged residues. That maybe you could even imagine that it's a singly, single positively charged residue, another single positively charged residue, or a bunch of those coming together, and suddenly they form a very, very strong positive patch. Uh, in that sense, it's a conformation. You have to come together. Now, if you wanted to look for these signaling, uh, the, these kind of motifs, you could, for instance, label those motifs in alignment, pick out the motif, try to find the motif in proteins that you could not identify just looking at the alignment. Because, in fact, maybe whatever, if you did an alignment of the full sequence, you would see some, some signal in here that is not relevant for that search. Right? So, the motifs allow you to go further out in terms of sequence similarity and identify motifs, signatures, aspects of biological reality that are relevant. When we look at the sorting of proteins into in the eukaryotic cell, we see there is a major path here, that's all this blue, which is secretion. So everything that goes toward the proteins that go to, toward the outside are on a secretory pathway that begins with the endoplasmic reticulum and goes further. Some of those proteins are retained here in these vesicles, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, other vesicles, and some of them are main, retained in the membrane, some of them are getting out. There's a gated transport here between nucleus and cytosol, and there are other direct exchanges between cytosol or cytoplasm and uh, particular compartments such as mitochondria, peroxisome, plastids and others. Um, signal peptides classify... Oh, have you heard this word signal peptides? You all have? What is it? Um, ah, let me just... I need a second computer, now I know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's simple. It's all very simple. And this is the sure way to get rid of the coffee. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> um, oh, there's a minor problem. Yes, I can log into that tweet now, just like you can, but I can no longer ask questions because now I'm a participant. So we have, to, uh, we have to start a new one. Yes, life is simple, right? Oh, there's this issue too.
make my new one. Create eight. Oh. Okay, we do that next time. This machine doesn't work because of some reason or other. I have to restart the. No. No, no, no. I'm not so fast. Yeah. This time the code is Z4V. Small, I don't know what it's important, but they're all small letters. Um, so, the question is, is a signal peptide a zip code? But is it relevant for sorting proteins into all of those subcellular compartments? Is a signal peptide a motif that is for the binding of drugs? Uh, is a signal peptide a motif relevant for the sorting in one particular subcellular organization? That is C. Now the problem is we cannot write them down and I cannot remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay, there are limitations to the system, okay? And to my brain too. Uh, so, A, zip code. That I remember. So is the signal peptide the thing that uh, I can also not choose for you? And, and, and nobody else can choose for you either because everybody has only one vote. Um, so is the signal peptide the kind of zip code that is relevant for putting proteins into different subcell localizations. Uh, C is it for one particular subcell localization? And uh, B. Can somebody. B <laughs> 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 was the right solution, I just forgot what it was. <laughs> okay, okay, B is wrong. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get better at that. So next time I'm going to have only two alternatives. <laughs> it's easier to remember too. Hmm? I don't have a quiz. You don't have a what? A quiz. We need a... Uh, okay. The function is not enabled. Do some people have the... You do have Are you in the Z4V? Mm -hmm. Can you reload? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I have a now. Good. And he don't remember what A B and C was, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we we uh, we do remember that B was not the right one. So I took C. <laughs> ah, so everybody has done it. Now I have to reload. I, I my my machine needs. A, so I'm giving the talk with a machine that has some issues. I don't know. Try it. You can't, right? Exactly, that's what I thought. Uh, and I can't see your answers because my machine <laughs> is hanging. <laughs> I mean, not the machine, the network is hanging. Okay, okay, we get your point. <laughs> I understand that this is where you were going in the first place. But listen, this is, so my, my point is, uh, I've never seen a system that is as simple as this. Usually you, you buy these expensive devices, you train people for half an hour how they work, uh, and then you go to the next lecture room and they no longer work because there's something in the setup wrong. And you redo that. That is my traditional experience. Or you are signed into, so it's, it's money, it's complication. So this is simpler than anything else so far. Okay, okay, okay. I, I have the ambition to make it work a little bit. Uh, I don't know why this machine, so I need to bring two machines that are connected to the network. Ah, because it doesn't have a network connection? But it does have a network connection. Okay, 67% A, so zip code. And C uh, is 33% of the, the answers. Um, so, Ziga signal peptide indeed. Ah. Oh, this was sort of a giveaway. Uh, <laughs> secretary pathway. Good that you didn't see that. 
That's amazing. Um, so, in fact, they are really only for uh, secretion. And the background here really comes from Gunnar van Heine. Gunnar, uh, this is five years old, the age index of 75. Uh, so then seven papers cited over a thousand times. 63 is at Stockholm University, Royal Academy of uh, Sciences, uh, cited over a hundred times. And also, well, he, he gets a prize, but here actually he's announcing the Nobel Prize in 2008 in chemistry. So he's currently the secretary of the uh, chemistry Nobel Prize again. Um, and Gunnar introduced a lot of ideas and concepts related to membrane proteins, proteins, in particular membrane proteins related. Uh, but in this context, the entire work out of how signal peptides, what is the grammar, so to speak, what's the sequence language of signal peptides. Signal peptides are the signals that are used to bring proteins in the, into the secretary pathway. All right? uh, and this is Sven Brunak, another shaper and shaker with a, again, this is five years old, age index of 52, uh, many highly quoted papers. In fact, many of those are what I'm going to present in a minute, uh, signal P. And somehow the person who brought, uh, Sven Brunak is known really for his machine learning skill, is the CBS command, uh, or Lingby. And Henrik Nielsen, somehow is the, that is, if you want a little bit more the experimental background, the historical background of the biology, sort of model machine, modern machine learning background, and Henry collected the data sets and brought the two worlds together and worked out a method called signal P. The way he did that, he essentially began by collecting data, looking at some simple features that, are, that you can write down on a slide like that. For instance, characterization they are essentially N-terminal, so at the beginning of the protein. They are typically between 15 and 30 residues long. They are cleaved during translocation across the membrane. Do you understand what that means? So, let me just turn that around. Uh, <laughs> I also might want to prove you wrong. Uh, but I now can locate into my own. Yes? Um, so, the second statement, cleaved, means A, that in fact you have, say, 15 to 30 residues at the beginning of the protein that are cleaved off by some other protein and never used again, that is A. B, cleaved during translocation in the membrane means simply that while they are translocated through the membrane, this is sort of folded back onto it so that the protein gets out. That's B. A or B. The beauty is I don't, I, what I really like in this is that I no longer know who did it and somehow uh, the probability that you get many answers is higher. People no longer abstain. <laughs> now they vote. Honestly, I didn't um, refer to your system. It's not my system. No, it's the system you use, but uh, in general, I don't like to use it because it makes people uncommunicative and all the stuff. Yeah, I see some problems with this. Yeah, you're totally right. What I'm trying to do is to see, oh, we have a complete tie here. Uh, by the way, you came, you came later, um, and so we're talking about a website called TweetBack. Do, do you have a machine that can use a URL? So all you need is a, U a browser. Go to tweetback.de and then type in Z4V. And then you will sort of see, uh, this is a 50-50 complete tie. Uh, now, what I claim here is on a, on a normal talk, I would have just moved on. Assumed certainly after the point, so it was only that, that tool here that made me stop at that bullet point. And only because I took the bullet point, I asked the question. When I looked around, I absolutely had the sensation that 
everybody says yes, they understand what it means. Now I phrase a question that gives an alternative and actually 50% got it wrong. 50% got it right. So I would have never seen that before. In some sense I would, I would call that success. Uh, I don't know how much it helps you and how, much, how important that really is. And that is the, the other part of your point, right? It distracts from, from essential parts. It's essentially what you're saying and I'm not entirely sure. But this clearly I did not expect, I did not see in the room. So it really is the case that we have a long fraction of the protein that in fact I'll show you later, I'll show you in a minute, uh, can be up to 50 residues long that is cleaved, cut off and will never participate in the life of that protein again. Which is remarkable if you remember that proteins are only 100 to 400 residues long. So 50 is a lot in that span, right? It means that you, if you think about the energy it takes to string up a protein, okay, you have an amazing amount of loss of energy that is only used to transport that protein somewhere. Okay? So it's a very, let's call it, if it's zip code, that is a very costly zip code. Okay? Uh, but it is. It is existing in all three kingdoms of life. So it's in eukaryotes, prokaryotes, because secretion getting out of the cell is in all organisms. That brings us to another issue. Why do we secrete? Why do bacteria put proteins out of there? In particular, so for eukaryotes, the story uh, is slightly different because eukaryote is a multicellular, eukaryote is a, most eukaryotes are multicellular organisms. Prokaryotes are typically not. Again, they're colonies, uh, but some prokaryotes completely live on their own. Why would they secrete proteins? Transport um, toxic um, stuff outside. Garbage out. Yeah, that's a it's a good idea, but you do. It is in fact true. Okay. Uh, let me. Yes, that happens. Okay, but in principle, it would not need to be true. You could imagine that you just have a, a hole in the membrane and you sort of push it out, right? Not that easy, and that is why it's partially true, uh, and that's why on the other side. But this is all membrane attached. This would not explain how you have proteins that are completely non-membrane attached outside. So, which you do have in bacteria. Why do you have those? Again, there are examples where what you say is true, but think about something else. Oh, I actually forgot the term, but some bacteria actually know how many of them are around by secreting stuff. Yes. So as you sense the environment. What else could you? So uh, one, one thing that you may want to sense, Jade, as Jade said, is the environment, is, is uh, other bacteria. What else could you sense? So even for, hmm? Nutrients. Exactly. Food. You have in fact, most bacteria have a way to maneuver, uh, to orient themselves toward getting closer to food. Uh, or, in some sense, it could be other bacteria who are foes or enemies. So, uh, but certainly intruders or, or some you could begin to put up a protection shield. Uh, like the umbrella that is above you, that is not part of your body, it is extending over you. Uh, so put up a protection shield to fight intruders rain, snow, or whatever it is. Uh, in the world of bacteria, it's not really rain and snow, but whatever. Um, and they have a relatively, let's call it architecture. Architecture is a misleading word. Uh, in this world, we typically talk about architecture, about something that has a logic to it, something that has a structure to it. Not structure in the sense of protein structure, 3D structure, but some, okay, let me show you what I mean here. Uh, there's an N-terminal region, again, N-terminus is the beginning of the protein. There's a hydrophobic region, the H region. Uh, there's a C region that, and the cleavage site. Cleavage site is exactly the place where the enzyme will cut this signal peptide. Uh, the C region is the one that uh, has some charges and comes before. Uh, uh, sorry, the C region is actually polar and uncharged. Uh, the H region is larger than six residues long uh, and is hydrophobic, six hydrophobic residues long. Uh, the N region is um, 
has, has charges. Uh, the plus here is a mistake, has often charges, and there are some rules about the cleavage side. Now, how could you put rules about the cleavage side and such rules here into a formalism? So far we are on the level of a slide. We are on the level of writing down, so I observe 20 different cases, I see there is something hydrophobic, I see there is something that has no charge, is, is some polarity, there's maybe some signal, sequence signal for cleavage. How could I put that into a machine or into an algorithm or into something that is more probabilistic? What would you use? Well, how would you go about this? Any idea? Um, I would collect um, long-signal peptides mm -hmm. and try to construct a model, for example, a Markov model, mm -hmm. and Perfect. use it to predict other sequences. Yes, and so in the hidden Markov model example, for instance, you could imagine that you have, uh, essentially in this example, you have four different states. Right? And then at every single point, so you start from residue from the first residue and you go into, well, the first residue is sort of clear, you go into the interminal region, but the interminal region could be single peptide or not, right? So you always build into the model both possibilities and then you go on and so you have a certain transition probability. Where do you get the transition probabilities initially from? How do you train your model? So Jade knows the answer, the way she looks at me. She looks at me as if that was a dumb question. But can somebody else say, or is it a dumb question for everybody? Is, uh, when you have enough sequences, you can calculate an average most probable length of the region. And this would also correlate to the transmission stuff. So we would, that is true. So now you're talking, but you, you say something that essentially contains the answer, but you, you're bringing up some other feature. Uh, so you say we could define any of these regions, except for the last one, uh, cleavage side is shorter. Uh, we could define any of these regions, so in one sense it already alludes to that, it has to be longer than six residues, by the observed probability of length. So the observed probability of length should enter the transition. So when you loop back into the H region, so one way of creating that in a hidden Markov model is you would have six H's. So once you get into one, you have to follow all the H states and then you can get out again. Or another way could be that you, according to how many you already have visited, you loop back or loop into a new state probabilistically. And that's what, what you just said. But the question really is how do you build the first model and implicitly, of course, your answer was you use the data. Uh, in order to build that. Now, there is a tiny bit of a little bit of an additional problem here, uh, and this shows the solution in some sense to that problem uh, for gram positive, gram negative, and eukaryotes. The point that I mean, this is the cleavage side. And this, the height of the letter is proportional to its information content. Yes, it's just the bits, it's not uh, the entropy. Uh, the information content of the letter, so the higher, the, the more informative that state. So this one has a lot of, uh, I assume this means alanine in the vicinity here. Um, I don't see what the second highest is. It's a glycine, uh, serine, at least in eukaryote it appears that way, but what you may see, I'm sorry for the quality, I took it, took it out of the paper, so they are to be blamed. Uh, so my, I'm sorry for the quality of the, the graphs, uh, I was lazy. But these are negative values. So the point is that if you create these letter plots, you have the issue in some sense of the length. You have to put it into registry alignment. You cannot just look at a sequence alignment. Because now every, for this particular module, the cleavage side module, everything has aligned to be aligned to that cleavage side. If you had the hydrophobic region module, the story is slightly different because there you really have uh, six and more and uh, a certain variety that is shown no, it's not shown. Yes, the signal peptide length is shown on this one here. That signal peptide length is now considered everything up to the cleavage side. 
everything up to the cleavage side, blue, gram uh, negative, I assume, or positive, so this is gram negative, uh, gram positive, and eukaryotes in red. You see that the eukaryotes follow this sort of 15 to 30 figure that I showed you before. Uh, in gram negatives, they are longer. If I understood the word right. Uh, so in one of these two bacteria, uh, they are longer. They might, uh, most likely they are longer for the ones that have a double membrane. Uh, well, maybe not. Whatever. Um, so there is a certain variety. Now this, of course, influences the length of the hydrophobic region. So if you have this longer one, then the hydrophobic region will also be longer. The charge region is more restricted, the n terminal region is more restricted. So, mostly what will differ here between the pro pro prokaryotes and the eukaryotes is, in fact, the hydrophobic region, the length of the hydrophobic region. So, this you cannot do the to the hydrophobic region. There, you really can only use a Markov model approach where you loop through the states. So, that's one approach. Now, in this particular pr approach, you could also, in fact, learn by neural networks. Uh, the problem with the neural networks is you cannot put the, put the grammar easily in. So you would have to put the grammar into the way you connect the networks. Uh, and then there is a method that combines uh, other methods. I'll say something about that in a minute. Uh, as you can see here, the neural network was the first, 97. The hidden Markov model was the next one, and that sort of is a giveaway if I ever ask the question, uh, which of those two is better. Uh, the hidden Markov model works much better because you can put the grammar into the problem, uh, and you can really code the probabilities very well. Um, so in Copenhagen, they published a lot. So I said that CERN has a couple of papers quoted over a thousand times. Most of these are, in fact, these signal peptide related uh, papers that became an instant hit and changed the world. It's the tool that everybody in the world uses. Um, there are many others, but they really did not take off. Now, one issue that relates to signal peptides and membrane proteins is that the two are s confused. And they are confused because why could you, why does anybody in the room, could anybody in the room imagine why they are confused? Signal peptides and, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so I give you the option on Tuesday um, to, to, never, to never do it again. Um, actually, maybe that's the moment. Could I publish the quiz? I cannot do a new quiz. No. Okay, no. So, um, the question, or the, is it true that membrane helices and signal peptides are confused because signal peptides are for secretion and membranes are for secretion. Or is it true, so they're both essentially the, the sort of same environment, part of the same set of proteins, uh, proteins at the outside and somehow this, the proteins that you talked about that get garbage out are membrane proteins, the secreted proteins. Uh, or is it because both of them have hydrophobicity that uh, is the background. So B, hydrophobicity, A, because of the same compartment. Chris is open. Do you want to see? Is it the third, the third question? Yes. Because I just have yes. quiz two. Yeah. Oh, you don't have quiz three? Yeah. Okay, so we move on in my lecture to some other topic and then we get back. <laughs> What about now? Do you see it? No, I still don't see it. Because I can no longer see it. <laughs> Quit the quiz. No. <laughs> 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 
So can you see now? Yeah. Yeah. A, we're talking about the same compartment. B, we're talking about hydrophobicity. That's why they're confused. Six votes. Uh, wait, maybe I have not uploaded this. So, okay, we have it. Um, so this case is, is a five to eight, five, five hydrophobicity three because we have the same compartment. In fact, it is the hydrophobicity. Uh, the, the majority was right on this one. Uh, what I'm showing here is a bunch of proteins predicted by different membrane prediction methods that have no signal peptide. Uh, and about soluble pro proteins with a signal peptide. And what you see here essentially are misclassifications. So some proteins, uh, some prediction methods misqualify as many as 97% of all the proteins. Okay? Uh, and they are, in fact, this is one good membrane prediction method. Uh, then there are method, HL top is another example. So these are very good membrane prediction methods, but the amount of mistakes they make, 56% or 20%, but very, very high, right? So then you see here low numbers. And it turns out phobios, polyphobios, and phileos, the ones with the low mistake number here, are all methods that con at the same time look at signal peptides and membrane mahelices. So they, in fact, try to distinguish the two. So they, is, let's call it the next generation. They acknowledge there's a problem. Hydrophobicity may confuse my prediction method, and they come up with a prediction method that considers the signal peptide. In fact, they use signal P input. Okay. That is the best we can do, and still there's some error, uh, but this, in fact, is much lower. Um, and these are phobios, proctopus, there, there are a couple of methods out there. Um, now, by the way, just to make this, to, to round up this story, um, I have to add an additional complication. Yes, cleavage means they, they are cleaved. But in some sense, previously there were some people who said uh, not cleaved but, but shielded. And to some extent that was actually more right than I acknowledged at the time of asking that quiz. Because for some proteins, actually the signal peptide or part of the signal peptide is inserted as a membrane helix. It stays that way. It's not cleaved off. So it really stays a membrane helix. So this is the ultimate uh, problem for, for uh, predicting or for the distinction. You have something that is essentially looking like a membrane helix, and it is a membrane helix. That's very complicated to predict, and that is why the problem ultimately at the end of the day is really complicated. Are there other signal peptides? Well, yes, there are. So in, in fact, they are very similar. Since this is biology, they have, of course, different names. Uh, they are different in detail, but from whatever I told you, they are N-terminal, they are hydrophobic, they have a cleavage side, they have some charges, some non-charges. They are, in fact, recognizable by machine learning. There's another feature that is very important for the signal peptides that I talked about. Signal P, I talked about an NN neural network, I talked about a Markov model, ultimately machine learning devices. Ultimately, something that is relatively easy to do. And that is true for all of these. Uh, secretion here. The transit peptide is for chloroplast plants only. The targeting peptide for mitochondria. Again, the motifs, if you look at the logos, the letter alignments of the cleavage site, they look different in detail. But what is the same is everything else about it. You can train in this particular case. You have three different machine learning devices. They all came from Denmark here. Mito P, Chloro P, and Signal P. And then there's Target P that sort of finds the best compromise between all three. Uh, there's another type of motifs. And I'm not entirely sure why this one went in here. Uh, let me get it out. Let's get to nuclear localization signal. The nuclear localization signal is a signal that makes proteins be transported to the nucleus. It is like this, mostly like this one, so it's really sequential. There's a protein that has the signal, nuclear localization signal. There's a protein that recognizes the signal, importing or transporting many others. Uh, they recognize the signals, put the protein through the nuclear pore, 
which really is like a big basket, uh, pretty hole, pretty open hole, into the nucleus. Okay. Um, when we started our work, what we found at the database pro site, which collects motifs that are essentially taken from the literature when experimentalists define motifs, they are tested, they are put there. And in pro site, we found one particular motif. That motif at the time at which we did that matched to 96, 15 years ago, matched to 96 proteins that are nuclear from 30 something, 31 different families. Uh, accuracy was 90%. So that men, means that of every, so when we run this against a data set of proteins for which we know the subset organization, 90% of the ones that are picked up by that motif are in fact known to be nuclear. 10% are known to be non-nuclear, okay? Um, and 3% of all the proteins that at the time were known to be nuclear are covered by that motif. So it's one nuclear localization signal that clearly is very informative about whether or not the protein is nuclear, but it's not covering a lot of nuclear proteins. Our task, our idea was increase that number. And uh, that is a task that may be on the level of a bachelor thesis. Uh, how would you do that? Find new localization signals. Find new motifs that are relevant for classifying proteins or for, for shuttling proteins into the nucleus. Idea? Mm. When you have a um, Go annotation like DNA binding, you can look at a specific um, gene or protein and then you can look um, stream upwards and you find some similarity between several Go proteins which are DNA binding and maybe you recognize uh, short sequences. So one, one, uh, one way would be to uh, identify motifs by motif finders that simply align sequences and see whether in a bunch of proteins that do not share the similar sequence, so you could take proteins from different families and see whether there is a way to align them such that at least you see a motif. It's a little bit tricky because you, by this construct, if you look at proteins that are not easy to align to find distant motifs, then it's difficult to align them. So here we have that, that circle. Uh, if you look at motifs of proteins that are too close to each other, then what comes out is just the sequence similarity, not the motif. That's a little bit the tricky part. But yes, uh, this is one way to try. But I meant something completely different. What I meant is assume that there are other motifs out there. They are just not in your database. How would you find those? Or would you actually answer the question of whether that may be the case? ProSight is, again, this is a frozen picture from 15 years ago. Uh, and today this would no longer be true in ProSight. Uh, but at any time, the, the same thing could happen today. I do not know what the number is today. Uh, but it may still be such that I ask the same question. How do we find out whether there is something else that ProSight has not integrated? Well, we could call the guys at ProSight and ask them. And actually, sometimes really you should use that. So uh, even in big databases, just sometimes try. If, if, you, if you have a valid... Uh, so w the, the kind of questions that I would not recommend to ask is, uh, you know, I couldn't open your web website because uh, how do you spell E or something like that. Uh, in effect, it's remarkable. So I'm, I'm, I developed this server predict protein that was the first internet server in molecular biology in 92. And the vast majority of questions that came through were exactly of that type. Questions that were not very pleasant for me to see. Uh, there were many, 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 at some point we started a blog site and we, we started to see there were many people who used this server very, very seriously and had very interesting questions. But they never sent the email. The email came from, so what I learned from that is induce in you this, if you have something that is interesting, if it's just the shears, if you read a paper and you like it, just send the guys uh, who wrote that some positive feedback. Uh, 
if, if you have a question, again, do, do, do this. Don't be shy on that. Uh, but avoid the, the sort of trivial questions. But again, okay, I, I made my point. But back to this question here. Assume the prosite, prosite is not complete. It cannot be. Now my task for you would be, in a bachelor thesis project, so just a few months, bring me some new motifs. How would you get about this? Okay, my first approach would be, like, take this one uh, sequence which is in prosite and uh, find proteins with by sequence similarity and use them as candidates. Oh, that we have, right? So this is all already here. I want new motifs. I want new motifs. And I don't want to find motifs uh, by motif finders. Uh, Maybe I did not ask my question right. Uh, what, I, what I want to find are new other motifs that are experimentally characterized. I'm sorry, maybe that was not clear. No, obviously that was not clear. Um, any idea? Ah, come on, it's very much simpler than you think it is. Guys, what is I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Where, where would you use? What would you do for, to search for papers? Which site or? Yeah, how would you search for papers? Um, okay. um, I would search for example, Scora, PubMed. Yeah. So by the way, let me just put that down because I've realized that there are several people in my, my group who have never seen PubMed before. Um, uh, clearly, Google and PubMed are very important answers and not only important answers, just do it. Uh, Google, most of you will do. Maybe not always get, you may find just too many things. Uh, what you may typically discover in Google is our resource and things like that, uh, which is good. So you, you get a good feel for what is out there. But n experimental things that are not discovered yet, maybe PubMed is better for that. But again, so you may start from, uh, from known resources and uh, add on that. In this particular case, uh, Murat Chakol did a short uh, stunt in our lab and he simply read a couple of papers uh, and collected the motifs. Those are the motifs. Red lettering here means positively charged residues, K-O-R. Uh, Arginine or lysine, right? Uh, so immediately it hits you that clearly there is a higher than one in ten probability of the of the so more than one in ten. So K and R twenty re, uh, twenty letters, two of twenty is one in ten. Uh, so the the random frequency of red would be one in ten, and that is clearly higher, right? That's the first observation. So they're high in positive charges. Um, Anybody any, any idea why? That could be. Fair enough. Um, we'll get back to that. So in some of these cases, when you look at it a bit more closely, you see there are sort of uh, patches of positive charges, spacer 19 in this particular case here, a patch of positive charges. Uh, now we're feeling too cold. And there are some more in some of these cases. In fact, we have like this one here, a motif that is published and there's only one particular positive charge and this is in that experiment implied in the nucleus. Now in this case we have something again that I showed you before, patch positive, excess patch positive. But all over, uh, basically we, ha we have these bunch of motifs. Now what do we do with them? Let me get back in some sense to uh, in, implicitly what, what you said, is we first, of course, run our motif and see how many of these we find in a motif, to see how many of these are, in fact, new motifs. That's clearly true. Uh, but something else. Now you have your motifs. Are they right? Well, you have a publication. You can say, I found them there. I trust them. And this is what a typical database annotator would do. Uh, in this lecture, we are more about prediction methods and about not doing the first step, but going beyond the first step. Um, so let's just say this is, is not what you do in the first day of, of learning computational biology, but 
when you get to the master level. Then you reflect and just don't, put, don't just put it into the database, but you reflect first. And that's the reflection phase. How do you reflect on those motifs? Yeah? You look for the function of the related protein and um, you can say that maybe a DNA helicase is um, useful in the nucleus. Yes, you can do that. Uh, it is this idea. There, there is something now to be said about uh, numbers. So Murat did a good work in extracting quite a number of motifs. Yes, for every single one of those, he, there's a paper underneath. For every single one of those papers, there's some idea about what they do. And you could sort of begin to classify that. And that is one viable way. It's not that easy, though. This is a lot. I know, okay. You, if you, yeah, it's true actually. When Murat did that, the Gohan classification didn't exist in that sense. Uh, today it would actually be easier because she could just map it into the Go tree. Actually, it's a good idea, and that's, that's easy to do, to, to, to do today. But there's something simpler, or simpler, uh, if another step you should do first. First, you have to check whether those motifs are true. So some experimentalist has implied them in being nuclear. Well, you know, they are experimentalists. They have their view of things. They don't really understand numbers. Uh, we are computational biologists. We, uh, we learn the tools of seeing what is true in one protein may not be true in another protein. We have a culture of cross-checking certain statements with computers. They cross-check with experiments we do with computers. So what could you do in a computer here to see whether that is compatible with our view of the reality versus large data sets or something like that? Okay, how can you test whether they are right? These motifs, welcome. Do latecomers get, get uh, cake too? <laughs> Everyone will get cake. <laughs> he, he baked it. Um, you're not selling your cake. No. Because typically more people watch this lecture than, than actually in the room, so you could put your telephone. Anyway, um, the question really is how do I check whether these motifs are right? We have a bunch of motifs, I didn't count them here. Uh, it's over a hundred that experimentalists imply with the nuclear localization. How can you check whether it's true? Try something like cross-validation. Just use it's a nice word. small sample and then you, the others should be predicted with a quite high probability. Because they should be. Implicitly, you say maybe it's for everybody too simple. The first thing is you build yourself a two data sets a data set of proteins that are nuclear, known to be nuclear, and a data set of proteins that are known not to be nuclear, and see where they match. Right? It's cross validation is just a complicated word, but this is the first step to do. Okay? If you want to check the validity of a sequence motif, you see where else do you find that in the universe. And you ought to start with a, well, you could just run against all human proteins. But for, for all human proteins, you may not have that annotation. So you should start with a more controlled data set. Controlled data set is this data set of proteins for which we know they're nuclear, not nuclear. Because that is what we are supposed to see here. Somebody dies. Uh, um, now, in this, what we dubbed in silico mutagenesis, we in fact did the next step. So first we checked the validity and then we saw that many of those in fact are not valid in the sense that they do map to many proteins that are not nuclear. Our impression was maybe this is because they are not specific enough. Okay. Let's just look at, at one more motif here, uh, the one that I picked out before. Uh, not specific enough, could be, it could be that this is around the nuclear localization signal, but they are m missing a few residues, right? 
so that the motif, as it's spelled out with one single positive charge, in fact hits many non-nuclear proteins because that is not the nuclear nucleation signal, but it's part of it. It could be totally wrong. Uh, but our first attempt was, can we possibly find a way to improve them, or improve is the wrong word, uh, change them such that in fact they really recognize only nuclear proteins when they're nuclear localization signal. We had another, in this process here, we introduced another rule. Uh, the other rule was we wanted to refine motifs such that they would hit to two different families so that we evade this problem of just looking up sequence signals. So we wanted things that are mapped in two different families and are never two different nuclear families are never mapped in a non-nuclear family. And this then we would call good motifs because they would find more than blast two different families and would never find anything that is not nuclear as again by according to the knowledge I have today. Maybe tomorrow I'm going to find proteins for which this no longer works. And in fact, this is 15 years old. Uh, we have just rejected it and we saw that there are some issues here now. They're no longer 100% accurate. Uh, but that was the design at the point. Now, let's begin here in the first round. If you do not find two, but only one family, then we can discard it. Good. But you can argue this may be true because that motif is too specific. Okay? How can you make it less specific? Take any of these motifs here, the long ones. How could you make that less specific? Yes, it's very trivial. Somehow you cowardly refuse to be with me today. Is that because of the treat? <laughs> just, just cut it, make it smaller. Yes, where would you cut? Just, just take this motif. How, how would you make it smaller? That's fair, but give me some idea. <laughs> it's not about knowledge. You wouldn't have come to the course if you knew. Science is about treading the unknown, so you have to work with logic and intuition. So you learn something that already tells you what is wrong as an answer. I didn't tell you what is right, but... Uh, Cut it just in the middle. That's exactly the point. This is the direction of what I mean. So you clearly already know, it's a, it, bless you, it would be a bad idea to cut in the ends. So if this is about some patches of positive charges, the intuitive first thing would be cut the ends, right? And that's exactly not right <laughs> in this particular case. So you would cut somewhere here. Cut means you could, for, for instance, convert a letter to an X. So you just have a regular expression, any letter matches, matches or something like that. Uh, now, this could be guided by looking at alignment. You could, now we're back again in some sense to your idea, you could just take for that stretch the alignment of, a, of, of the family itself and as a first, if you flip one residue to an X or one letter to an X, then of course you take the one that is least conserved in the family. And then you move on and you see whether you maintain a motif that is such that you in fact, that did not maintain whether you get a motif that is such that you now match two families without getting too generic, without ever hitting a non nuclear protein. And yes, you, you iterate. When it's, uh, whoops, when it's too short, you make it longer, again, driven by an alignment ideally, and by your knowledge that somehow you want to sort of hit some positively charged residues. Uh, and you do a couple of iterations of this cycle, right? And that worked very well. So we ended up uh, with, with a clean data set. We ended up with a sort of, in this way, in some sense, predicted data set that is like motif finding. is sort of started with an experimentally known and expanded with a data set that ultimately was such that by construction of the data then we had 100% accuracy sort of trivial because we never allowed anything in, our, in the data that we knew that was not nuclear so it has to be 100% uh, accurate at the time uh, but the coverage was 43% meaning that initially we started with a one prosite motif that had 3% uh, coverage of all the nuclear proteins and now we were up to 40 
roundabout, of the then known nuclear proteins. That is no longer true. Uh, but what is true here, what remains true, is that we have a, uh, this is a method that, that worked very well. Now, once you have this method, what would you do with it? Well, you can publish it, but I would argue you, before you publish this work as a manuscript, you should put some other analysis into it. What would you do? Yeah, I don't know, I'm just I'm t I'm trying to find somebody who says something, but... Compare it with another method? Great idea. Uh, in, unfortunately, so again, the the part about this being old here, uh, this was the, the the one that there are many many methods out there now. But when we did that, there was none. So they sort of started it uh, with a successful publication, and so many people copied that. The only thing that we could compare ourselves to was really this one single prosite motif. Um, but. You're totally right, this is what you always have to do. In this particular case, this was more complicated. Uh, but in terms of biology, what would you... And by the way, your idea of the GUM mapping, I believe today I would immediately induce in the student to do that next. This, this was a great idea. Uh, at the time we didn't have it. And just looking at functional names, uh, I found misleading. But today this should be done and they should be classified by GUM terms and put onto the GUM tree. That would be the absolute next step. Totally right. Uh, in fact, nobody has still, we still haven't done that. It's a great idea. Open, open project. Uh, but something else. Would it be crazy to like, check for interaction with components of from PTP cycle or something like that? So essentially map it to particular kick pathways? to just generalize what you say uh, and see where in these CAC pathways do you see neutralization signal. That's a great idea. Uh, it's an expansion of the functional ca characterization idea. Uh, and it's something that, again, is absolutely great. We couldn't do it at the time. And I haven't seen that. Great idea. In fact, this is a totally cool idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting around for to it. I never had that because we can talk about that offline. That is a totally cool idea. <laughs> Somebody should do that. Um, I talk about it. In a, in a, I talk about it in a few minutes. So what we did instead was something much dumber than that, uh, but still we found it interesting. So we ran the method on a bunch of entirely sequenced organisms, um, shown here. Uh, e. coli. That was a very important one. Why? So remember the way we optimized the methods, we method, we used a bunch of proteins that were known for their subcellular localization. So now we have motifs and now we want to sort of give them out to the world and at that point we have to make sure that there's a larger data set where we can be very certain that, I mean you have to try everything, uh, finding a data set where you can be very certain it's much larger than known subcellular localization and still you know something about the outcome. It should be zero. Right? Bacteria don't have, uh, prokaryotes don't have karyotes, don't have nuclei, so they shouldn't have nuclear organization signal. Uh, so you always have to try to find some way in which you can, it's not always e easy. In this particular case, it was very easy to find a big thing, an entire organism, for which we could apply it and could check whether it works. Uh, and then we, we sort of got these numbers. Now these numbers here, in fact, this is larger than. And the larger than is explained by this is not the fraction of uh, Drosophila proteins, 21 Drosophila proteins that are found to be nuclear. Because from this we know we have a 43% coverage, or we believed at the time. We, t these numbers are no longer, we, we now know these numbers are not really right. But at the time that was the best we knew. And from that we can infer, we get every other, right? So the actual number here was 10. But since we miss half of them, we estimated that the internal composition of nuclear proteins was 20 something, right? Back to you. Is that surprising? I remember when I saw that, I was very surprised that we have uh, that many nuclear proteins. Um, 
we can then, in some sense, look at proteins that are predicted to be uh, nuclear by this method and um, not known to be nuclear. These were some examples. And we can, for instance, look at structures. Where do these nuclear localization signals that we find, if we have a structure for those, where do they find? Where do they fall? That is the nuclear localization signal. As you all know, this is DNA. So what does it mean? In this particular case, the nuclear localization signal binds DNA. Do you know anything about the biophysical feature of DNA? It's negatively charged. And here we get immediately the explanation to what I phrased earlier. Why is it so positively charged? Well, that is not quite it, but, but you begin to see the suspicion. The suspicion is the following cycle. It's a beautiful cycle. So you have the nuclear localization signal that is high in positive charges. You have a molecule that recognizes that signal. And again, in contrast to the, I didn't make that point clear, uh, in contrast to the signal peptide, this is not N-terminal. This is not machine learnable. They are very diverse. We see positive patches, uh, but so far nobody really had, has developed a prediction method that is machine learned. Uh, we have hundreds of examples we can learn from, and they're very diverse. That's one reason. Anyway, so you bind to this positive patch, bring it into the nucleus. In the nucleus, most proteins bind DNA, or many proteins, they are bind DNA. The importing, the shuttle protein, goes off the nuclear localization signal. The positive patch stands out, binds DNA. The cycle completes because you go off the DNA, have a competitive binding with an X protein, with a protein that shuttles it out of the cell again, which again binds to the same signal, competes for binding with the DNA, this way the DNA dissociates, uh, X protein goes on, you go out and you're free for the new cycle. And this is in fact exactly why you saw the correlation between the nucleolization signal uh, and the DNA binding, and that in fact allowed us to develop a method that, that predicts DNA binding sites, at least for some residues. Not all nuclear localization signals bind DNA, but some do, and this allows to predict directly DNA binding. You can then map that uh, to what I showed you before. So proteins annotated in Swiss prot, experimentally annotated with subcellular localization, using homology-based inference, using the key keynotes, keywords, and the analysis missing. Uh, so the slide is slightly misplaced. Um, sorry for that. So that is the end of today's lecture. And we get into the question part. And